sure. Um, actually, Alyssa is going to start us out with a bit of what motivated us to write the book and what the context was of our initial kind of drafting um, uh, process and publication process, and then it'll pivot to me and then, and then Daniel, so we'll sort of divide up those 30 minutes um, among us. Great. Um, yeah, thanks everyone for, uh, for coming out. Uh, it's nice to see you all um, this evening. And, and as Thea said, um, I'm going to just give a little bit of an overview of what we were, um, why we wrote the book, what the sort of conversation in the U.S. Um, has been that we were trying to intervene in. Um, it is, uh, you know, the book is oriented towards U.S. context, but hopefully um, applicable beyond. And it'll be interesting to hear, um, you know, we'll be interested to hear your thoughts on sort of um, similarities, differences in the questions and comments, um, uh, and just give sort of a sense of, of the overall kind of um, intervention the book's trying to make, and Thea will give more of an uh, overview of some of the details, and Daniel will um, bring us up to date with sort of where things are now and where some of the conversation around the Green New Deal is in light of COVID and, and the sort of responses to that. So um, basically, uh, so we wrote this book very quickly uh, in, uh, over the course of about a year ago, last, um, last spring into the summer, um, and we were responding to what seemed to be a pretty significant change in the climate conversation in the United States. So um, I would say that this began around fall 2018 uh, with a sort of sequence of um, there was the uh, the campfire in Northern California that killed uh, dozens of people and uh, uh, you know destroyed thousands of homes and, and left a lot of people homeless um, and uh, that was uh, caused by a sort of combination of um, negligence by the private utility company um, PG and E uh, and obviously as we know sort of the the kind of climactic changes that are um, happening uh, where you have sort of um, a drier, um, like a combination of both wetter and drier seasons <laughs> in sequence that make uh, the conditions really right for, for fires to spark off. Anyway, so this is what was perceived as a climate disaster. Um, there was an IPCC report um, declaring this sort of 10 years to save the climate report, but, um, you know, saying how little time we have to really cut emissions to um, to keep emissions below 1.5 degrees Celsius rise. Um, and then uh, in November, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez was elected to Congress um, and immediately announced that a Green New Deal was going to be one of her priorities. Um, there were the sunrise sit-ins uh, on Capitol Hill, including in Nancy Pelosi's office, um, demanding a Green New Deal and green jobs. Um, and through these sort of combination of things and other things were happening too, but uh, there was a sort of sequence of events that, that suddenly had put the Green New Deal on the on the table as part of a climate conversation in the U.S. and in what seemed like a very different way than we'd seen it before. Um, there had been sort of um, discussion of green jobs, um, of a Green New Deal even, going back to the Obama administration, but it was usually a much more... Um, uh, a much less ambitious vision of climate politics that was much less integrated with sort of um, what are tra traditionally described as like social justice or social issues type concerns. Um, and when the Green New Deal resolution came out um, a little more than a year ago in February 2019, um, the AOC and Ed Markey put forward, um, and that was sort of the big resolution that was outlining sort of a, a very... <laughs> Um, a loose set of principles that might structure a Green New Deal. Um, we, were, we were both excited because we had not seen anything that had that kind of comprehensive vision of how climate policy could be um, integrated with housing policy, with uh, labor policy, with uh, transportation, with food systems, with all of these different aspects of um, politics and uh, socialization, sort of um, just aspects of daily life that we know that climate change is intertwined with and being produced by and, uh, and can't really be separated out from. Um, so we were very excited to see that, but it was obviously a very short document. It was like six pages or something. Um, and so what we wanted to do with this book was sort of both um, articulate the vision for why a, a climate program should be comprehensive um, and should, should have those kinds of connections to, um, to other areas of social policy um, and also uh, to put, sort of flush it out a little bit more um, and to, to add a little more content to what was sort of this like skeleton framework in the Green New Deal resolution. Um, 
And so some of the responses, uh, you know, there was the responses to the Green New Door solution um, from a lot of people where I think there was, there was simultaneously a lot of excitement around um, the idea of a Green New Deal and some kind of ambitious climate policy, but there was also a lot of criticism. Um, obviously from the right, there was sort of like a blanket rejection of any kind of climate policy and sort of rejection of the Green New Deal in particular as like, you know, eco-fascism or um, the, whatever the right sort of describes this sort of totalitarian climate state coming to take away all of your freedoms. Um, but even amongst the center and center right and center left, which is <laughs> most of the left in America is this, really the center. But anyway, um, so even amongst those folks, uh, there was a lot of like, why is, you know, why does this climate program have all of this other stuff in it? Why does it have, um, again, healthcare, housing, jobs, all of these things like shouldn't we keep it very narrowly focused on energy, um, uh, maybe a carbon tax, um, a sort of uh, a much more minimalist view of climate policy and the kind of climate policy that we've seen for, um, I think, several decades now, and particularly for the past, uh, you know, this was the sort of vision of climate policy during the Obama administration um, that did not get very far, but that, you know, I think nevertheless remains um, sort of the, the goal for a lot of folks who are, um, you know, again, in the sort of uh, liberal uh, center left space. And so what we're, um, you know, our response to that is that um, we really see all climate or all politics as climate politics and try to um, talk about how and why we need to, um, to not only understand sort of the, the ways that climate uh, is produced by and then sort of uh, both the climate change is produced by the ways that we work and the places that we live and the ways we get around and all of these things, not just sort of a very narrow vision of like the energy system that you can swap in or swap out, um, but also uh, the ways that climate change and its effects will sort of um, have repercussions in people's lives uh, all, you know, in terms of sort of uh, whether they're displaced by climate disasters and they need housing, um, whether they uh, are able, I mean, well, now we see a very different kind of catastrophe <laughs> that's making people lose jobs. Um, but you can imagine a lot of, uh, of versions of that. So we wanted to both articulate our vision of why climate change is sort of, um, you know, permeates all of these other kinds of areas, but also that a, a vision of a climate policy that could actually mobilize um, uh, popular support. So um, often the critique from, I think, um, the, the more centrist, like, um, climate folks is that you it's it's a it's a view of climate policy or climate politics that's very um focused on expert agreement and sort of elite consensus um and that's not uh doesn't really have a vision of um climate politics being popular it's more something that you try to sneak past people um try to make as like minimally um intrusive in daily life as possible and we wanted to put forward a vision of how climate policy could actually um improve people's lives rather than asking for sacrifice asking for green austerity um asking for a, a vision of sort of like uh where you tighten your belt for future generations or for um for uh, the kind of an abstract nebulous idea of the climate or for people living in another part of the world, um, a vision that actually could uh, address people's needs um, and not put the sort of burden of transition on people who have already been struggling with, um, you know, job loss, austerity, all of these things for a long time. So that's the kind of general um, vision we had for the book and what we wanted to do with it. And we wanted it to be, you know, it's a short book. It's not supposed to be comprehensive and talking about every single thing um, that uh, climate policy or Green New Deal would do, but we wanted to lay out um, what we, our vision of what we call a radical Green New Deal um, and try to <laughs> prevent what we thought of as sort of the dangers of co-optation, although um, we can get into this more. I'm not sure how, how much we are seeing the Green New Deal in some ways that we should be a little bit more co-opted because <laughs> some people are just like, oh, we're, we're not even going to. Um, there's been a sort of different level of, I guess, relationship to it. Or some people have tried to, I think, use the language of the Green New Deal without sort of going in on all of the kinds of more robust um, commitments and other people have just um, rejected it altogether. So, but we can get into that. So I'll let Thea say a little bit more about what the um, kind of different pieces of the Green New Deal we try to address are.
Thanks. Um, and uh, a lot of the sort of broad themes that, that Alyssa just um, presented, I think, will kind of be picked up in, in the chapters that, that I'm going to detail a bit. Um, I won't do a thorough summary, but just kind of like walk us through the narrative of the book and why we chose to focus on the four areas that, that we did. Um, so the, the first chapter after the introduction, which lays out a lot of what, what Alyssa just said in terms of our overall argument, um, the first kind of substantive chapter focuses on the fossil fuel industry. Um, and the reason that we started there, it might seem really obvious to start there to like a room of environmental activists, but I just want to give a little bit of like why that was important to us to put as a first chapter. Um, one is kind of a negative reason, which is that the AOC Markey resolution that really like started the, the big debate and conversation around the Green New Deal in the US um, in um, early uh, 2019, February 2019, is that possible? Oh my gosh, anyways, time's moving very fast. Uh, so that res congressional non-binding resolution um, that laid out an initial vision for a Green New Deal made no mention of fossil fuels or the fossil fuel industry. And to anyone reading it with a sense of kind of climate politics in the US, it was clear that that was an intentional like conflict avoidance strategy. Like we're gonna lay out a pretty transformative vision about how to transition the US to renewable energy and create tons of jobs and protect frontline communities. Um, but we're not gonna right now pick a fight with the fossil fuel industry and so what we wanted to start our book with was like picking that fight in a way like saying like we absolutely need to confront the fossil fuel industry um, they're our main enemy and our main obstacle they're our main obstacle in the sense that they are the um, they're they are what's standing between us and a low carbon world right like the, the the companies that contribute the most to to emissions and to other forms of environmental destruction are fossil fuel companies um, and and their sort of allied companies in the petrochemicals industry so we think it's important to first and foremost lay the blame for them in terms of the emissions that they cause but also like confront them in a political sense because in the us and elsewhere in the world, but in, in some particular ways in the US, I would say, like the fossil fuel companies just have tremendous lobbying power and have really distorted and corrupted the political process such that even more incremental and moderate forms of climate policies, um, which might have been more effective, you know, 10 or 20 years ago at this point, we obviously can't can't do moderate policies anymore, but even those more moderate policies were um, uh, totally undermined by fossil fuel lobbying. So we need to kind of confront the fossil fuels both for environmental and emissions reasons and for political reasons. And then kind of a little more on the political piece, there's this, and Alyssa already alluded to this, but oftentimes in environmental and climate politics, there's this like vague and diffuse and shared sense of responsibility. Like we're all responsible for this problem. So like, we should use paper straws or like we should stop using plastic bags or we should do this or that in our personal life. And I don't want to, you know, make fun of that because I do that myself, but I don't think of it as like a solution to the climate crisis. Um, uh, so, you know, I think this kind of vague sense of responsibility um, not only involves kind of changes to everyday life that don't necessarily add up to like dealing with what we need to deal with, um, but actually can demobilize people because feeling guilty, feeling a little bit vaguely responsible in a kind of negative way for some, um, for, for the climate crisis, I don't think actually motivates people to want to take action. Um, the four of us see politics through a kind of left populist lens in which it's more galvanizing for people to have a clear enemy and uh, there's no better enemy um, really um, like if you know if you wanted to write a novel with a great enemy fossil fuel companies would be an excellent enemy right they like they're all terrible their executives are ter terrible they break the law they violate all sense of moral you know whatever like they're they're good enemies so so we focus on them as as enemies and in a very literal sense um, propose um, prosecuting fossil fuel executives for crimes against humanity. Um, but we also have a number of other policy prescriptions outside of the kind of like juridical realm around, you know, both limiting the, the demand for fossil fuels, that's kind of, you know, normal um, climate policies like a carbon tax or carbon price, but we're actually much more excited about policies that directly limit how many fossil fuels can come out of the ground. So kind of supply side policies, like keep keep them keep it in the ground, which is the demand of the global um, climate justice movements. And we propose some policies that would actually help keep coal, gas and oil in the ground. Um, so that's our first chapter. Our second chapter kind of pivots towards um, 
who would fight such a fight, right? So like we see who our enemies are, we see the types of policies that we need to demand to get off of, of dependency of fossil on fossil fuels. Um, but that's a very difficult battle because fossil fuel companies are extremely powerful and have a lot of allies um, in, in politics. And so the question of like, who could lead such a fight is, is a difficult one. Um, what the, the four of us um, um, have like learned through just like studies of, of history and our own involvement in politics is that bottom up social movements are the only way to get tra progressive transformative change. And then in particular, the labor movement, given that we live under capitalism and the working class is like the biggest class of people that um, has something to gain from transforming society is needs to be pivotal here. Um, but, you know, given that that we're fighting for some for a specific type of transformation, which is the Green New Deal, we need to think about like what type of labor movement could win a Green New Deal and even a little more deeply, like how might implementing a Green New Deal change what we think about of as work, as like the purpose of work, of, of, of um, the types of work that we value in our society. Um, so we focus um, on sort of two different prongs of, of the labor movement, um, and we see both as having a really important role. Um, one is, is where the more traditional focus tends to be and where perhaps a focus like this group, because I know a lot of what you all talk about is, is a just transition and thinking about what a just transition for Scotland would look like. So one piece that we focus on is, is just transition kind of traditionally understood as um, transitioning workers out of the fossil fuel and other environmentally destructive industries and like what would it look like to have a transition in which they that they stood to benefit from the transition not not that they lost and not even just like maintaining but actually like seeing themselves in in the movement for towards um towards renewable energy and seeing themselves as beneficiaries of that so that's one piece that we focus on but the other piece that i think is a little more innovative that we do in the book and this draws a lot on on Alyssa's, um, um prior work is is broadening the idea of what green jobs are so not just not just thinking about um, you know transitioning a fossil fuel worker to be like a solar solar panel installer like those kind of traditional that the kind of limited notion that green jobs are just in the energy sector and we're swapping out one type of energy job for another um, but instead thinking of green jobs as any job that is needed in a low carbon and democratic and egalitarian society. And one of the main categories of jobs that would be more needed in such a society is care work. Um, care work is work like childcare and elder care um, and healthcare um, and teaching and all sorts of jobs that go beyond those probably um, that, are, that are centered on care caring for each other, caring for communities, um, making communities flourish. And also we could even broaden that towards like caring for nature um, and jobs like environmental remediation or something like that we could put under the umbrella of care work. But care work is um, either inherently low carbon in some cases or no carbon or very easy to make lower carbon because care work is about relationships um, either between humans or between humans and nature it's not about producing objects in the world which inherently means that you're using material resources right so care work has um, has a really kind of privileged position in our in our vision of what labor would look like uh, you know as we win a green new deal and there's also a, a kind of political piece of this to echo what I was saying about the politics of confronting fossil fuels and then thinking about who could fight that fight. The other thing about broadening our conception of green jobs beyond the energy sector is that right now in the US and across a lot of the world, some of the most militant, active sectors of the labor movement are precisely in care sectors. So nurses and teachers and service workers in the US have been on the forefront of making this past year the biggest strike wave since like the 70s or something. Like we have had a historic strike wave. It's still nowhere near where it needs to be. It's nowhere near the New Deal kind of era, but it's it's much more than we've seen for the past few decades of kind of neoliberal hegemony. And so it's it's really inspiring. And it just happens to be that those workers are exactly the type of jobs that we need to value and have more of in a in a green new deal society um, and it happens to be that those workers are tend to be women of color immigrants and people for various reasons that are already kind of on our side politically and, and, and are tend to be more progressive and a lot of those unions have actually endorsed the green new deal or kind of incorporated green or environmental elements into their contract bargaining so that's uh, um, that that's kind of thinking about the who would carry out this fight and the, the, the labor movement. Um, and then we transition to um, uh, what um, kind of social scientists call 
the built environment? Because the question is sort of like, what would the labor, what in a Green New Deal kind of um, uh, society, what type of world would we actually build and how would we live in that world? Um, it's not just about labor as a fighting force, but labor as a kind of like world creating force. Um, and the world that we want to build is one in which we totally transform how we live, where we live, what types, what our neighborhoods and communities look like, what our transit systems look like, what our energy grids look like, because all of those, especially in the sort of U.S. model of like suburban, um, uh, like the sort of suburban regions of the U.S. that are very sprawled and um, you have to have a car to go everywhere and everyone lives in detached private housing for the most part, um, that, that kind of model of, of built environment is tremendously environmentally destructive. It requires, as I said, people to drive. It, it encourages leisure, leisure activities in the form of privatized consumption um, and so on. And it also happens to be in the US very racially and economically segregated, right? So, so the built environment um, it is not just high carbon and carbon and resource intensive, it also locks in all forms of inequalities and, and oppressions. So there are multiple reasons to transform the built environment. Um, and what we imagine instead of the built environment that we currently have is um, one in which housing is, is free or affordable. So we have a vision of social housing, but also housing that is low, low energy use and green in terms of the building materials. Um, we have a vision for how to transform our grid to make it, of course, renewable in terms of the energy sources, but also to make it nimble and resilient in the face of extreme weather. Um, we have a vision for mass transit as opposed to like everyone has an individual Tesla, which is one way of thinking about electrifying transit. We have a vision of mass transit, but again, one that is nimble and flexible because you know we've seen in the US at least that it can be challenging um, politically and in terms of uh, financially to like just build a whole high speed rail network, right? So what if instead we had more flexible forms of transit like electric minivans that actually could operate in suburbs even before we transform them to be denser, right? So we, we have a number of different proposals around, around transit that interlock with our housing proposals and our proposals for how to transform the grid. Um, and I think, you know, two last points on, on this chapter. One is that we, in addition to this kind of like just normal kind of everyday life, like housing, transit, work type of and energy grid kind of stuff, we also think more broadly about the built environment in terms of public luxury and pleasure, right? So I said before that a lot of the ways that we tend to consume on our leisure time, so-called leisure time, which is really just us doing other work for capitalists, capitalism by being good consumers and by reproducing ourselves so that we can go to work the next day. Um, what if instead leisure was low carbon, was kind of in sync with the environment, was also about human relationships and being in public and collectively consuming with other people. And so we have this idea of temples of public luxury, which builds a lot on work that Daniel has done previously and thinking through recreation and leisure and togetherness as, as things that we want to expand and support with public money um, in a sort of Green New Deal society. And the, the last piece on this chapter is that we also think that there's, again, a political angle here, which is that making these concrete improvements in people's everyday lives and using public investment in ways that are palpable and immediately clear that, yes, this is better for my life. Like it's better to have access to mass transit. Um, uh, it's better to uh, have an electric grid that uses renewable energy because it doesn't cause localized pollution. Like people will immediately realize the benefits of those improvements and then be, will sort of broaden the coalition. So I, I just spoke a little bit about the coalition, the sort of labor piece of the coalition, but we could imagine a whole host of other communities and social groups that would get on board with this, especially as they saw the built environment transformed for the better. Um, and then the last chapter kind of takes us all the way back out to where I just ended is sort of on that neighborhood kind of scale, um, but kind of thinking all the way back out to the globe, right? It's, you know, oftentimes work on climate politics starts immediately with like the kind of planetary dimensions. Like this is a global problem. It's a global crisis. We need global cooperation. We actually don't start there because we don't necessarily think it's the best place to start politically. We made that conscious choice to start with demonizing the fossil fuel industry rather than starting with like international agreements that are often technocratic, 
honestly kind of boring. Like I'm a political scientist and I can't follow half of the things discussed in these kind of international arenas. Um, but also they're by design, not very effective because the biggest polluters, um, both in terms of firms and in terms of countries and governments have a big role in these negotiations and intentionally make them ineffective and unbinding. Right. So, you know, as sad as it is that the U S is no longer a signatory to the Paris Accords, like the Paris Accords were like nowhere near enough for what we need to do globally. So we kind of build through the book and build kind of the narrative arc and then at the end zoom out to the global. Um, and, and the way that we look at global climate politics is actually less about those types of international agreements that we do talk about global cooperation, but it's more about sticking with those concrete points from chapter three and about the built environment taking seriously the fact that transforming the built environment in the US or Scotland or wherever in the world will actually potentially require a lot of raw materials um, from the earth, right? And some of you, again, you all are environmentalists, you read about this stuff, so you probably are aware that, for example, an electric vehicle requires a lot more mined raw materials from the earth, whether it's copper for the wiring or cobalt and nickel and rare earth elements and lithium for the batteries, right? So there's all of this stuff that a that a um, electric vehicle requires that that requires us to take stuff out of the earth, and we know that historically, um, especially under the system of global capitalism, uh, mining and extractive industries in general are sites of dispossession, of contamination, of violation of worker and indigenous rights, um, and we are very wary and very attuned to the fact that we don't want the renewable energy transition to reproduce all of that. Um, and so we have basically, and I'll, I'll sort of end it here because I'm probably coming up on the end of my time, but just to be brief, what, what we propose is a two-pronged strategy to, to um, not reproduce the, the exploitative kind of nature of, um, of resource extraction, but in a sort of under the banner of a renewable energy transition. And one of those is a left vision of green fair trade. So that's kind of where global cooperation in the more kind of traditional sense comes back in, but building it kind of from the ground up, so to speak, by, you know, bilateral and multilateral and maybe eventually international agreements, um, but between governments that agree to be committed to these sort of basic principles and agree to hold up labor rights and indigenous rights and environmental integrity as more important than like the profitability of, of the trade, right? So kind of flipping the neoliberal trade model on its head and prioritizing um, uh, the earth and people and communities and workers and also prioritizing the equitable distribution of green technology, which right now is held hostage by um, by intellectual property rights and and just by the expensive price price tag of, of of a lot of green technologies, whether it's solar panels or electric vehicles. So reorienting trade to be green, to be fair, to be equitable. Um, and just a side note, we Daniel and I and a few others um, recently conducted uh, did a study that that involved some polling in the U.S. and we found that like majority support for for this model of green fair trade because most people actually don't like the like so-called free trade model which has led to deindustrialization and all these things so they're actually a lot of people and, and voters are, are open to a different model of trade and this one apparently polls quite well so just that as a side note and then the last piece of chapter four is kind of alongside and in interaction with these new forms of global cooperation um, and and left understandings of, of trade we would like to see forms of, of bottom up kind of people solidarity across borders. And we kind of think about like, what if the supply chains that produce, that extract, produce and distribute for green technology, right? So we kind of trace the supply chain all the way from Chile where lithium is extracted to China where the batteries might be produced to the US where maybe the electric vehicle is consumed. What if those supply chains, which are currently sites of exploitation and environmental harm, were actually sites where workers and communities engaged in alliances across the nodes of those supply chains to make them better for workers and communities and for the planet? So we think about kind of bottom-up solidarity, repurposing supply chains um, in the interests of global climate justice. Um, so I'll end that there and turn it over to Daniel. Hi. Um... Thank you all for joining us um, in this conversation. Um, we're, we've gone on for a while, so I'm gonna try to keep it um, brief. Uh, I think that, you know, we're in a difficult situation right now, obviously. COVID is like a massive health crisis. It's likely to contribute to a really big change in our political economy. And 
in some ways that really changes the circumstances of the prospects for Green New Deal. But I think in other ways, it looks a lot like the kinds of crises we expected to face, certainly in terms of like a political economic collapse of the neoliberal order and the need for <clears throat> massive investment um, that brings, lifts up workers and lifts up communities to find any way out of this that's not ultimately some form of, of right-wing nationalism or, or even eco-fascism. Um, so our kind of intuition in the book is that rather than working deductively from the abstract principles of eco-socialism or you know, green Marxism, um, as fascinating as many of those are, we also want to work inductively from what are the kind of concrete short-term challenges of tackling political economic crises and slashing uh, carbon emissions at the same time, as well as creating kind of resiliency. Um, so I think we see the challenge of a kind of Green New Deal type response to coronavirus in terms of how can we find alignment, political alignment, um, economic alignment between the things we have to do to deal with this health crisis and the economic fallout and the things we have to do for climate reasons. So in the wake of the collapse of the Bernie campaign in the US, um, a bunch of us, including Thea and I, have put together a letter calling for a green stimulus. Um, and this has been signed by a bunch of people and it's getting a bit of traction uh, in Congress. And we're trying to kind of refine some of those big picture Green New Deal ideas and say, here are some concrete jobs forward programs. Here are some green investments. So really thinking about narrating the jobs benefits of investments of renew in renewable energy, of the, the need to retrofit you know, millions and millions of homes in the next few years. That came up in the comments on the side. How can we spell out the jobs benefits from that? How can we put housing movements and labor unions and environmentalists in coalitions together around that kind of work? Um, how can we make the case at a time when people are understandably freaking out about treatment um, and testing and all of that. How can we make the case for a longer term strategic reinvestment so that we're kind of reinflating the economy in, in green terms? And that's especially complicated in the US where the Republicans are essentially using the Green New Deal uh, as a way to attack any proposal to really do anything at all about coronavirus. So the kind of, you know, to sort of sum up, I think the big thing that we're trying to do is to realign the substantive ideas of the Green New Deal as kind of economic reconstruction responses to the COVID-19 health crisis. And there's a lot more we could say about that and we can talk about that in questions and answers. And the last point I'll bring up before we get into the Q&A, I think we're looking at a lot of climate disasters. Um, it's already happening around the world. We've had hurricanes, we've had flooding uh, you know, outside the US. Um, we have major kind of climate disasters uh, when and the relief efforts have been stymied by fears of the COVID pandemic spreading. And I think that another big challenge we'll have as these climate disasters hit in the US, it's wildfires coming to California within the next month, the record heat this summer. Um, we're looking at a substantial flooding in the US. We're looking at potentially a record hurricane season. I'm not sure what the corollaries would be in Scotland, but I'm sure you're looking at similar things there as well. And I think we're gonna, on the one hand, those disasters will make it easier for us to make the case that some kind of climate action is necessary, but it will also be harder because we'll be confronting yet more situations of desperate immediate human need, and we'll have to make the argument for long-term policy responses um, as well. So that brings us back again to, I think, foregrounding the concrete short-term economic benefits of all of our environmental policies, especially in terms of jobs. Um, the whole book is organized around the idea that we can reduce the, res the, the resource intensity of our prosperity. So I don't think it's a question of falling back on green growth as a solution to all of our problems. But we do, again, have to foreground those immediate material benefits, I think, if we want to even get into the conversation about economic uh, recovery from the COVID epidemic pandemic. Um, so I'm conscious of time, so I'll leave it there and excited for uh, a conversation. <laughs>